received his BS and MS degree in electrical engineering from Brigham Young University in, I will leave out the dates. <laughs> 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 he received his PhD degree from Southern Calif University of Southern California in, in 1989, also in electrical engineering. And since 1990, he's been in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at BYU and is currently associate professor. He lectures in the areas of digital signal processing, digital image processing, and circuits. So I'd like you all to welcome Dr. Jeffs. Now, <coughs> the technology for high sensitivity radio astronomy for years has been based on very large single parabolic dishes, or, well, I guess Arecibo is actually a spherical dish. But focusing energy to a single antenna, a single horn feed. Uh, you get high sensitivity that way, but it's very hard to form images unless you scan the dish back and forth across the sky and create a raster scan like you would with, the, with a television that scans an electron beam on a CRT screen. Um, so you can only look at a small spot of the sky at, w at a single point in time. But if you want high sensitivity, this is the way to go. Now, more recently, there's been some work in trying to extend the number of spots on the sky that you can observe at any given point in time. So, for example, uh, the Alpha Array at Arecibo has a seven-element feed horn, so instead of one antenna at the focal point of the dish, we have seven here. Uh, the Parks Array in Australia has a 13-element horn feed, so the idea is that each of these feeds, or antennas, uh, observes the dish from a little bit offset angle in the focal plane, and you can observe a different spot on the sky. So with one pointing, the dish can see uh, more points in the sky. It expands your field of view. Now, that idea is being extended, elaborated, and improved with, uh, by a number of groups. There are about four groups in the world right now who are looking at densely packed array feeds. Rather than separate high-gain horns, we're looking at closely packed smaller antennas. The idea here is that instead of forming uh, discrete, physically separate 13 beams on the sky, we can form electronically by phase shifting, by array processing, we can form an arbitrary number of beams on the sky and get a much more um, continuous look at the distribution of sources. So this is, uh, this is actually our array, our experimental array, uh, installed on the 20-meter telescope at Green Bank, uh, <coughs> West Virginia. This is the... Uh, the array put together by the Astron group in the Netherlands. This is Apertif. This is the FAD array developed by uh, uh, DRAO in Canada. And then this is, this is an interesting array. It's a checkerboard style of antennas uh, being developed for the, uh, the ASCAP array, which is a, a square kilometer array pathfinder system that's uh, being uh, built now in Australia. So a lot of different approaches to uh, kind of the same problem. Now, single dish applications are not the only possible use of phased array feeds. Uh, if you placed such a, an array feed on something like the VLA or even the Allen Telescope Array, you could expand the field of view dramatically. Instead of looking at one patch of the sky, you could observe a much larger region with a single observation. Okay, so let's kind of explain what are the real advantages of phased array feeds. The primary issue, as I've already mentioned, is increased field of view. So with the phased array feed, 
you can steer simultaneous beams in as many directions as you want within some limited field of view. Now, I mean simultaneous. The beams are formed electronically after the signal is digitized, and you steer them by multiplying uh, in, the, in your computer, in your uh, beam former, uh, by a set of complex weights that shifts the pointing direction of the beam. And you can do that as many times as you want, as many times as you have computational resources for. So the idea is that when we're looking at some deep space object, we look with multiple high gain pencil beams all at once by processing the same set of array data. Increased field of view, that's the real driver. And, you know, for an application, uh, you know, that would be consistent with SETI Institute goals, you can imagine what an advantage this would be. You can observe more of the sky in less time. So increased survey speed is really an important driver. We're calculating improvements for a practical array feed of 10 to 40 times. I guess we could call it a reduction. Uh, we're reducing the time required to collect the same data on the sky. That could really help survey operations. By the way, feel free if you have any questions to to interrupt, I'd be happy to address them. Another exciting opportunity is that with a single dish, we can actually do imaging, make a radio camera. So we think of this big dish as just a big uh, lens on a camera. Instead of doing synthesis images, uh, as you do with the Allen telescope array, for example, we can take a look at the sky and make a direct image uh, you know, it's kind of a small patch, but we can actually do radio camera, radio camera imaging directly. Uh, and we can form beams as arbitrarily close together as we want so that we can get very smooth distribution measurements of source intensity on the sky. Now, there's some side advantages, some fringe benefits that <coughs> probably wouldn't be important enough to pay the uh, exorbitant bills that may have to be paid to do this, but they are uh, something attractive. Interference cancellation. Now, I've illustrated that, that here. Suppose we have some man-made source, whether it be an overflying satellite, a ground-based transmitter, some unknown interfering source. We can actually use the beamformer to form a spatial null in the direction of the interference. And in that way, we can reduce or remove the interfering signal and continue on with our observation. This can be done in the spatial domain rather than frequency or time domain. You can remove it before you get to the spectral processing. And that's a real advantage. <coughs> we have the potential of increased sensitivity. If we have a, a fairly large phased array feed, we can manipulate the illumination pattern on the dish so that we use a, a higher percentage of the total dish surface area without uh, increasing noise input from spillover regions or, you know, looking at the uh, warm temperature of the ground. So that's a possibility that's being studied. Uh, another problem with these array feeds, uh, if you hark back to that Parkes telescope where they had 13 separate horns, every time you move the feed off axis from the focal point of the parabolic dish, it causes some distortion in the beam pattern. Uh, you get squint, you get coma, you get uh, side lobe levels going up in your beam patterns. So with a fully controlled phased array feed, we should be able to correct for some of those distortions. And that's another important advantage. Basically, I've addressed that point already. Okay, but it doesn't come for free. There are some difficult technical challenges with phased array feeds. Probably the most significant is that there is actually an increase in the system noise temperature. If the system noise temperature goes up, you're less sensitive. You can't see some of those weak sources. And this is caused inherently and specifically by the fact that you place these little antennas close to each other. They, they couple and noise propagates between them. Beam forming in this environment is not as well understood. Now, electronic beam forming has been studied for years and years in sonar, radar, and communication systems. But operating uh, under astronomical requirements with a, an array uh, coupled to a huge dish 
is an application that's really new, and some of the techniques that have been used in the past for beamformer design don't really apply here. Um, the system analysis and simulation tools, mathematical representations to predict and analyze and measure performance of, su of such a system really haven't previously been developed, so there's work to, to be done there. And another really big issue is hardware complexity and cost. You know, we need a very big processor here. Uh, since instead of bringing a single signal down from the focal point of your dish, you're probably going to be bringing up to 100 or 200 separate signals from separate little antennas. All of those need to have receiver channels. They need to have separate analog to, analog to digital conversion. And, and then downstream post-processing. In fact, uh, the correlation and beam forming that you need to do for such an array <coughs> could take computational uh, power that's equivalent to an EVLA correlator. That's pretty demanding. So there are non-trivial cost uh, hurdles that need to be overcome here. What is the uh, That's the uh, extended uh, very large array. That's the upgrade of the very large array in Socorro, New Mexico. The largest correlator that's Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so that is daunting. Now, on the, on the plus side, we can, uh, we can maybe scale back some of the bandwidth that we need to do operations on. And uh, we're very excited about uh, the uh, Casper Group products coming out of Berkeley with their uh, FPGA-based... Uh, beam forming and cor correlator engines, it looks like uh, that's going to give us some practical and more cost-effective solutions than, than the conventional approaches to correlators. Okay, so this is just a picture diary of some of our past activities. We started with phased array feeds in 2006. This is just a little three-meter dish uh, on the roof of our engineering building at Brigham Young University. And we were able to characterize performance, uh, form beams, and do some interference cancellation. We developed a 20-channel data acquisition system for receiving signals, streaming the data to hard drive, and then post-processing. And then these pictures of our, our, of our experiments in 2007 and 2008, where we mounted a 19-element 19 19 single polarization phased array feed on the 20-meter dish in Green Bank. Uh, we're currently working on development of a dual polarized uh, antenna and a 37 element feed, a little larger feed, and uh, with other improvements to improve uh, noise matching. Oh, I, I probably ought to mention here, our last experiment in uh, 2008, we were able to achieve the lowest system temperature yet achieved for a phased array feed. To date, all systems have been room temperature without any cryo cooling. So uh, most other systems are in this range. Uh, uh, you know, the noise levels are up around 150 Kelvin, and we were able to demonstrate a 66 Kelvin noise temperature. Well, from those experiments, we've collected several data sets of uh, deep space sources. This is an example of what you can accomplish with a single pointing, single look with that camera, with that phased array feed. Now, we've essentially formed over a thousand beams. This is a uh, 33 by 33 grid matrix of formed beams. Each pixel in the image corresponds to a beam. And we're looking at a bright source, 3C295. This shows essentially the point spread function, the uh, response of our system looking at a single point source. Now, the effective field of view is actually a little narrower than this. If we go out in these corner regions, uh, we're getting too far off of the uh, focal point of this dish, uh, and we start to lose sensitivity. So in this uh, circular region, about like that, we have what we call our field of view. Here's a little more complex uh, source. This is a, uh, an OH source, synchrotron source, and a nearby object. Uh, this is actually a mosaic made up of tiles. The tiles here are 11 by 11 pixels. So this is uh, 
a total of nine pointings, uh, and each pointing gives us an 11 by 11 uh, camera image. And we stitch them together to make this uh, larger <laughs> view. And this is exciting because this is never this has never been possible with single dish telescopes previously. Here's a little larger mosaic. This is the Cygnus X region. Uh, here's a previous image taken from the uh, Canadian Galactic Plane Survey just to show that we're seeing the same structures, that we, we're looking at what we should be looking at. Um, this is a 5x5 five five mosaic, again, of 11x11 11 11 pixel tiles. And uh, again, we're really quite excited about the ability with very few pointings to collect fairly detailed images with, with high sensitivity. Yes, question. Uh, yeah, the 11 by 11 pixels, we've truncated a larger uh, potential window we could have we uh, imaged. Uh, with a little bit of overlap, we get a smoother image. We haven't done anything, you notice some edge effects here between the tiles. We haven't done any sophisticated mosaic smoothing. Uh, this is just raw patches uh, abutted together, so this can be improved. All right, let's talk about that mutual coupling noise penalty problem. This is kind of a sticky issue. Here's a block diagram of how you would form beams with a phased array feed. So this would be our 19 element array with a, a little symbol here for each antenna. We have our low noise amplifiers, uh, receiver systems that produce a measured voltage at our analog to digital converters. After analog to digital conversion, we multiply each channel by a complex beamformer weight to and sum them to produce a beamformer output. Now we use a different set of weights for each beam that we form. The same data, same sample data, but a different set of weights. You can represent the beamformer operation as a vector inner product. This is the vector of time samples of voltage across channels. And this is the vector of beamformer weights. So for every time sample, we get a beamformer output, and we have uh, P beams formed here. Now, the problem is <coughs> that in an array, you know, an LNA actually uh, produces thermal noise. And you're trying to, you try to build a very high quality low noise amplifier by reducing its own self-generated noise, its thermal noise. And normally you just have that noise going through the amplifier and down the receiver chain. But that same noise propagates back out the transmission line to the antenna, radiates and is coupled into neighboring antennas. So the noise from this channel couples in to this channel. If there was an isolated antenna, there's no neighbor antennas to uh, couple into it. We don't see this increase of noise. So that raises the effective noise temperature seen by the array as compared to uh, a normal single antenna feed. So noise, yes? Can you use directional coupling on this? That is one of the techniques that uh, Carl's been considering. Uh, no, directional couplers would have to also be cryo-cooled. They're noisy themselves. They generate noise. We're talking about very low temperature devices. So you try and reduce, you, you don't want anything more, you don't want any uh, electronics between this, the antenna and the LNA that you can avoid. Yes? Could you use directional, uh, could you use uh, this alternate system from Trinity? We did this at Trinity also. Some That's a possibility. Um, well, let me let me uh, maybe maybe the next slide or two will address that uh, comment. Uh, to do, just uh, as a process, if you could repeat the question because we are taping this and it'll be available later on the website. And it's your microphone is the only thing that's picking it up. So if you could repeat the question, we'll have them as they go along. Thank you. We'll do that. Well. Normally, to reduce noise in a high sensitive, highly sensitive receiver system, what you want to do is match the impedance of the uh, antenna to the impedance of the LNA. Matched impedances reduce noise coupling. The problem is, in an array, 
that with mutual coupling, this, this impedance is really a matrix impedance. But further, we're taking these signals downstream and combining them after digitizing in this linear combination. So the noise seen at the output for a single beamformer actually depends on the beamformer weights. Now that really creates a complication because the active impedances, in other words, the impedance seen looking back through the system from right to left involves these beamformer weights. And so the optimal match, you know, if, you, if you actually look at the receiver temperature, uh, there's a minimum temperature, which is just the self-noise of the individual LNA. But this second large term depends on the match between the impedance or admittance here, the active admittance and the uh, admittance of the input of the LNAs. You want this term to go to zero. So if these are exactly equal, then this additional noise term goes away. But the difficulty is that this active admittance or active impedance depends on the beamformer weights. So if you're going to steer multiple beams, you can't match to a single match, and that really complicates problems. Now, how do you address this? Well, the, the simplest approach would be just to ignore the array and just do a conventional, uh, you know, 50 ohm match from an antenna designed for 50 ohms to a 50 ohm LNA. But that would make that uh, active impedance term get very large. Um, what you really need to do is illustrated here. You need to have a different z-opt. In other words, the impedance for the input to your LNAs should change depending on which beam you're pointed to. Well, you can really only do that for one beam. So that's a challenge. Another thing you might do is uh, design a very complex decoupling network that inverts the matrix impedance and makes them seem as if there is no coupling. They appear as if there is no uh, noise coupling at all. They're independent uh, channels. The problem with such a network, you can design one, but it only works at one frequency. You know, it's very, or very narrow band, so that's hard to do. So uh, Carl is working on an approach here to compromise. The idea is we don't really need to form beams over the entire sky. We only have a field of view that we're interested in. That's a narrow range. So rather than change the impedances of the uh, LNAs, why not redesign the antennas for the source impedance to be the best match on average over the narrow field of view of beams that you're going to form? So it's a compromise, and we're uh, in analysis finding some very good, uh, very good results there. So this is actually the solution uh, to the problem if you're trying to average, get the best average design here. So it's kind of looking at the problem a different way. Change the element designs, change their impedances rather than have a matching network here. All right, beam forming itself is a bit of a challenge. Um, there's a number of different things you can do. Um, as I mentioned, the conventional methods for beam forming are uh, not necessarily applicable here. Probably the bottom one is the one that would be most obvious, though anyone who's been involved with uh, beam forming would think, well, you just uh, run a numerical optimizer, you specify what side lobe levels and main beam width you want in your design, and uh, you just grind that out, compute what the optimal weights should be, and apply it to your beam former. This is a little bit difficult. The problem is that these arrays are very hard to calibrate. We don't know precisely the responses in every possible direction where we're trying to control the response. We can't take the array coupled to the dish and put it in the lab and take measurements over the whole hemisphere. It's just not possible. And we don't have sources with enough signal level. Even bright sources like uh, Cassiopeia A are not bright enough to give calibrations out in the deep side lobes. So this gets to be a little challenging. Our approach has been to use a statistically optimal view for beam forming. Now, 
this, this matrix, R sig, and this one, R noise, these are array covariance matrices. It's the expected value of the cross product between the voltages on pairs of antennas in the array. The array covariance matrices for noise, noise only and for signal only. This is a generalized Eigen equation. If you solve that generalized Eigen equation, the solution for W, the beam forming weight vector, guarantees maximum sensitivity. So what we have done is estimated these covariance matrices with real data by looking on source and off source, come up with sample estimates for these covariance matrices from calibration data and then solve for a weight vector. And that gives us a very, a very well behaved high gain beam former. Oh. One point I needed to make. Um, this requires periodic recalibration. Since there are phase shifts over time with these arrays, we're, we, and, and I guess you're familiar with that with uh, an application like the ATA or any synthesis array, you have to do recalibration periodically. So every so often we need to calibrate. By that I mean we look at a bright source, say Cas A, but then we off-steer in a grid pattern and just steer around the sky, letting this fairly bright source in the sky serve as a dominant signal. And we're trying to measure the array response in the direction of Cas A when we're pointed to this direction. And likewise for each other point in the sky. In order to form beams in all of these directions, we need to measure this array response in all of those directions. You can only calibrate out so far because by the time you get into the side lobes of the dish pattern, we don't have a strong enough source. Cas A, as bright as it is, cannot give us good calibrations for very many beam widths out. And again, we solve a, uh, a, uh, an Eigen equation here and do some noise whiting, whitening to get the best possible estimate of our calibration vectors. The, the signal that we observe, though, actually consists of the calibration signal of interest and then all of the noise terms, spillover noise, receiver noise, this is just the thermal noise from the LNAs and mutual coupling, sky noise, noise introduced just by loss in the couplers and cables. <coughs> okay, so here's some early results from our experiment at Green Bank. In order to form good beams, you need to know what the element patterns are. So the idea here is we take each of those calibration vectors uh, and look at them in a, in a beam former. This is a very simple beam former. The beam former says just put a weight of one on that element and zero out all of the others. So we're really looking at the response for a single element. So these are the individual element patterns. And it shows how as you look at a single isolated element and move around in the array, the beam on the sky is being shifted and steered. But these aren't very good beams because single elements don't, uh, they're not high sensitivity beams. They have, they're looking at uh, spillover noise. They see the thermal noise from the ground and they don't have a good illumination pattern. So what we want to do is take these individual elements, combine them in a beam former and get a well-shaped beam response. These are some examples of the max sensitivity formed beams. Now these look like much bigger spots on the sky, but uh, the scale is different than on that previous slide. So this is the maximum sensitivity beam formed uh, looking at bore site. And we see a nice shaped central beam. We see a little structure in the side lobes. This comes from the hexagonal pattern of the antenna elements in the array. And then we can electronically steer that beam off, you know, four tenths of a degree, eight tenths, 1.2 degrees. As you steer it off, you notice that we get some distortion. There's some coma distortion. Side lobes are changing shape. Even though this is a max sensitivity beam, it may not be the best desired beam pattern because you may want to control these and try and make this shape look more like that. Because you hate to have the beam changing as you steer different directions. We may have to give up a little bit of sensitivity when we off steer in order to control the beam pattern. And that helps give you 
um, high dynamic range when you're doing imaging, if you have stable beam patterns. Now here's a couple of approaches that uh, two different groups are considering for stabilizing beam patterns with phased array feeds. ASCAP um, at CSIRO in Australia has taken the approach that they're actually going to have a three-axis telescope. This whole dish uh, not only moves in elevation and azimuth, it rotates on axis. And the idea is to keep the um, support structures and the beam pattern fixed relative to the object on the sky as you move around during a long observation. That will keep whatever beam pattern structure we have stable. Uh, Tony Willis at DRAO in uh, Canada has also looked at numerical optimization. He's taken beam patterns like, well, let's go back, beam patterns like these which change with steering angle and manipulated them, uh, computed numerically in simulation what you have to do to change the weights in order to keep the beam pattern stable. Here's the boresight beam pattern main lobe, and as you off-steer it, uh, this is about a three degrees uh, off in, a, in azimuth and elevation, he's able to keep a very consistent beam pattern. So this gives us hope. The concern here is, though, this is done in uh, simulation, and it's not clear that we can do the same optimization with calibration data on a real array. So there's still some some hurdles to overcome here. But theoretically, it's possible to maintain stable beam patterns. Um, here's an experiment my student uh, Mike Elmer has uh, done, trying to look at, well, how well can we do with real data? If we have a realistic calibration, can we control the beam pattern? So here's uh, an optimized beam pattern in simulation, a detailed simulation of our array on the 20 meter dish at Green Bank. This is a, uh, it's an equal, equal ripple side lobe pattern design. So it's numerically optimized so that this first side lobe is the same height as the next side lobe and the next. If we apply the beamformer weights from this simulation to the real data, we get not a bad beam pattern, but it's quite changed. It's no longer equal ripple. The side, there's only one side lobe here. There's not uh, two equal ripple ones, and the main lobe gets fatter. So designing it in simulation didn't work. He's developed a transformation method to match the calibration vectors between the observed calibration and the simulated calibration, finds a mapping matrix to transform these weight vectors for the beamformer to something that we can use in real data. Okay, so here's the result, and now there's still a little bit of distortion, but we, s we see the nice equal ripple structure. So we're thinking this is the way to go, do this transformation for deterministic beamforming. Um, another thing you can do with an array feed that's kind of interesting and that is that you can adapt to the noise pattern that you're observing, the noise field. Now, the dominant noise terms in a, uh, in a regular radio astronomy dish come from ground noise seen through the spillover pattern. This array is trying to look at the dish only, but it has some response in this spillover region. Um, it also sees sky noise, just atmospheric radiation and galactic noise, so that's a source of noise, but probably spillover noise is the, the biggest term. As you tip the dish from zenith down towards the horizon, horizon, this spillover region sees cold sky, so the noise pattern changes, and the question is, can you, can you take advantage of that? So that's a study that uh, Mike did. Here's showing some of our spillover noise sources actually rise above the horizon. Now we're looking at sky. Down here, these spillover responses are, are looking at warm ground. And in fact, he has shown that if we adapt, if we adapt to that changing noise pattern, we can get a little increase in sensitivity here. This dashed line is for a fixed beam forming array, the green one. It's hard to see, but there's a red line. Um, Actually, I had that backwards. The green line is the adaptive one, the 
red line is the fixed one, we have a little improvement in sensitivity. The blue line is what you would see with a single horn feed. Nothing adaptive, no array processing. And then this line up here is what you would see if you uh, used a larger array, a 37 element array. So one of the exciting things we're finding is if we can go with a larger array feed, we can actually improve sensitivity dramatically over some of the best horn feeds that are out there. So that, that's something that we're looking forward to. Um, but in any case, we are able to adapt to that changing noise field. This is the same result looking at real data uh, from the 20 meter telescope. So our adaptive uh, noise maximum sens noise optimized maximum sen sensitivity receiver does have an increase in sensitivity. Actually, let's. Uh, This, this is kind of a block diagram showing the different, different uh, stages of the system that we have to develop good models, good mathematical analysis for. We have to model the sources of noise, the ground and sky noise. We have to model the dish with a numerical physical optics model. We have to uh, look at the array itself using uh, some commercial software, HFSS. Um, then we use network theory for the receiver and array signal processing for downstream. We have to be able to have tools, these analytical and modeling tools, to predict performance before we can build. Now one of the problems in this whole process is we can model in simulation uh, to get performance metrics like sensitivity and aperture spillover and radiation efficiency, but how do you measure them? on a real array. That's a bit of a challenge. So one of the keys, we've developed a, a methodology where if you can find out the response, the array covariance in response to isotropic noise, noise evenly distributed around a sphere, if you know what the array response would be for that kind of noise, we can actually dig out these other performance metrics that are common for arrays. This is a little hard to get, though. So we've developed a method doing hot, cold, on-sky measurements. We put our array at the base of a shield. The shield protects it from seeing thermal ground noise in the surrounding region, and it can just observe cold temperature sky. You then drop a, an absorber over the array, and that looks like local, isotropic, high temperature noise source, uniformly spread. This, that gives you a hot reading and a cold reading. This would be cold on sky. This is hot with the absorber. That difference with a scale factor uh, related to the actual temperatures you're observing gives you this measurement for the isotropic noise covariance. From that, you can tease out the aperture efficiency, sensitivity and other very important measurement, uh, performance measurements for your array. Okay, so here are some results we got with those measurements. Now this is a plot of the individual element patterns as we scan across a bright source. So you can see, for example, the center element in the array goes up and down as we, s as we steer the dish past a bright source. Some other elements in the array have different responses. When you combine all of these into a single beam, you get this nice beam pattern. Notice that the noise floor has dropped dramatically. We can drive that noise down because we're controlling the illumination pattern and not observing so much uh, high temperature ground noise. We've been able to measure the sensitivity of this system, 3.3 uh, meters squared per Kelvin. The t -sys at 66 Kelvin. This uh, matches pretty closely to our modeled results at 69 Kelvin. So if you take all of these measurements and stack them up and, and allocate them to the various sources, here's that coupling, mutual coupling temperature that I was talking about. That's a penalty that we can get rid of if we can do active matching. But even if that, we're, even with that, we're achieving 66 degrees. We want that to be as low as we can 
We need to get it down into the teens or 20s to be competitive with single horn dishes. Um, so if we use a cryo-cooled array, this can go down to the, to the very low numbers uh, in the teens. Mutual coupling we can get rid of. So there is hope in our current development path to come up with a, maybe a 20 or 30 degree uh, noise temperature for T-CIS. Here's a plot of our sensitivity as we look at the sky in our field of view. It turns out that uh, your sensitivity as you off-steer from bore sight varies a little bit with steering angle. So we get a little bit of ripple here. And that pattern seems to reflect the hexagonal pattern of the array. So one of the challenges will be, how do we flatten this field? Do I need to reduce sensitivity in some regions to uh, give up some peak sensitivity to make it uniform across the field of view? That's another issue that we're considering. Interference cancellation, that's uh, probably where I'm spending most of my time lately. This is, uh, this is an area that I think SETI might have uh, some real interest in because if you can eliminate interfer man-made interference, it opens up other bands for observation. Here's a demonstration with, uh, this is a radio camera image, single pointing, looking at a hydroxyl ion source. Uh, it's a OH synchrotron. So this is the source distribution with a single look. We then sent a student out with a function generator and an antenna and had him walk around on, uh, on the grounds there in Green Bank. We, uh, they didn't like us doing that. We had to get all kinds of permission to interfere with their other observations. With the interference turned on, it just clobbered the observation. We cannot even see the underlying OH source. So what can we do? Well, using adaptive array cancellation techniques, null steering beam forming, we're able to notch out that interferer and recover the original image in the presence of interference. So with adaptive interference cancellation on that array, it uh, really opens up possible observation windows you otherwise wouldn't have. Um, uh, this little... Uh, more detail than we need to go over. Let me just uh, uh, cut to the chase here. This is a plot of how much rejection you can apply on an interferer as a function of short-term integration window. Now you have a real problem when you're doing interference rejection. With, with uh, radio astronomy, we're looking for signals that are well below the noise floor. Um, now, interference may be small enough that it's below the noise floor, so you would, you'd hardly see it in other applications. But for radio astronomy, even that very weak interference could mask the weak signal that we're trying to observe. Most interference cancellation uh, requires a very strong interfere. It's kind of, it seems backwards. But the stronger the interferer, the easier it is to remove it. Why? Because if it's strong, I can get a good estimate of its parameters and create a nulling engine that notches it out and removes it. If it's a weak interferer, it's hidden by noise and other things that give me, it makes it hard to estimate the parameters of the interference. And if the interference is moving, that's even more challenging. Moving interference, uh, you know, if I, if I have a weak signal, I want to integrate for a long time, average and look at it for a long time to get a better estimate of its parameters. But if it's moving, and I average over a long window, its parameters are changing over time, and it smears my, my estimate of the parameters. So the short-term integration length refers to how long I'm going to average in seconds, or in samples, actually, here, to try and figure out what's going on with the interference. So this curve illustrates the amount of rejection I can get if there is no motion, and I just increase the, increase the integration time to get a better and better an e estimate of the interference, drive it down further and further. On the other hand, if it's moving, and I integrate longer and longer, I start to smear, and so my interference estimates are poor, the null is, is shallow. 
and then this curve is what I get with uh, conventional subspace projection interference cancellation if it's both moving and I'm changing the uh, changing the subspace integration time. So I have a real challenge here. I'd like to get down in this region, but I can't if it's moving. So we've developed a method where we we estimate, we model the interference covariance using a vector polynomial. This polynomial changes in time, and we need to fit the coefficients of the polynomial so that as the interference moves, we can actually track its motion. That allows us to do our estimation over a much longer window and have one small set of parameters that, that describe the interference behavior over a very large window. And that allows us to get this kind of cancellation performance. Notice that we're able to improve the depth of the null by a significant amount, and we're less sensitive to the length of our integration time, our short-term integration. So this is uh, a new method that we're <coughs> investigating and uh, we'll, be, we'll be publishing shortly. It looks like uh, it's ideal for the low-level interferences that are problematical still for radio astronomy. Okay. And finally, we are looking at methods of cryocooling our array. Um, Roger Norod at Green Bank uh, NRAO has built an experimental uh, cryocooled array element. This is a cross dipole or cross polarized dipole uh, with a ray dome um, and a cryo window that we can place over individual elements and still pack them in as tightly as we need to to build our array. So we're considering cooling both the antenna and the LNA. We're considering just cooling the LNA and looking at all these options. Most of the other groups that are uh, pursuing array feeds have made a decision at this point to stick with room temperature arrays. That limits their sensitivity. That raises their, uh, their T-REC, their receiver temperature. So our emphasis uh, has been on really low temperature systems. Uh, perhaps a little smaller array, but if we can cryocool it, we think that in the end we'll be ahead in terms of survey speed for observations. Uh, let's see, this is an L-band array, so that is about uh, 12 centimeters from here to here. Yeah, about 12 centimeters. Oh, the question was, what's the physical um, size of that array? Well, we still have some work to do, but we, we're excited about what we've accomplished so far. We've done the first demonstration of high-sensitivity imaging with a phased array feed. We're ahead of the curve on that. Uh, we've developed practical methods to calibrate. Uh, you know, phase array feeds are just a lot tougher to work with than a single horn feed. You do have to do calibration. We've developed methods to do that. We've got models and measurements for sensitivity, aperture efficiency, uh, and all, uh, you know, a raft of other performance metrics. Um, we've been able to optimize the beam former as a function of elevation and show that we can eke out improved sensitivity and uh, we've got significant progress towards interference cancellation that will work with moving interference in a phased array feed. What next? Well we're going to develop a 37 element array, a little bigger array, we're going to do dual polarization. Um, you can read through some of the items that we're planning to do. We're also anxious to build real-time systems. All of our work so far has been in post-processing. We stream the data to disk and then go back in the lab and in MATLAB we generate beam patterns. So we're uh, working towards real-time, near science-ready phased array feeds with usable back ends. So thank you very much. This is just uh, kind of illustrate what we've been talking about. Um, let me just quickly ask one myself, since I got the microphone. Okay. Um, 
as you know, the this is ATA land here, and yes. uh, we're not using a phased right. array feed on our dishes. And uh, can you explain a little bit about the difference between using a single pixel feed like ours? What are the advantages and the advantages of using a phased array feed instead? Well, I think you made a, a design decision early on on ATA to have a wide field of view by using smaller dishes. So, um, you know, that, that is, uh, in a sense, giving you some of the uh, benefits we're talking about here already. Uh, you compensate for that uh, small dish by having a large number of dishes uh, to bring up the sensitivity. So there are really some design trade-offs here. Um, the idea of a phased array feed allows you for any given size dish to increase the field of view. Uh, but there's some real practical balancing acts you have to make here. Where do you spend your money? And, uh, you know, for a single dish antenna, it makes a lot of sense. Rather than building another GBT, let's go back and fit it with a phased array feed, increase the field of view. ASCAP uh, has taken the the position from the beginning that they're going to use phased array feeds. And uh, that will give them wide field of view with a little larger dish. So I, I you know, you, you, you know, with ATA, there has been uh, already a decision made for good, good uh, wide field viewing. Question? Hi. Um, you quoted a sensitivity in order of 3.3 square meters per degree K. Yes. Can you explain the meter squared unit intuitively to help me grasp for how, that, how large values compare with small values? Sensitivity is defined as uh, the effective aperture over system temperature. So uh, basically if you have a bigger dish, you have a bigger aperture. You can collect more energy, increase sensitivity. Um, the system temperature is the noise level that you're working against. <coughs> so uh, the sensitivity measure, you want to have an, a bigger effective dish. Now, the, the, we have a physical dish. In this case, it was a 20-meter dish. But you don't really get to use all of that because the, the illumination pattern on the dish has to pull back from the edges to keep from looking at the ground, which is high temperature. So. To get high sensitivity, you want your illumination pattern to go as close to the edge as you can and then cut off abruptly and not see past the edge onto the, the ground. So what would be the stop rate value if magically you could use the whole dish to measure that? Uh, okay, the question is, what would be the calculated sensitivity if you used the whole dish area? And that would, our effective aperture would then be the physical aperture divided by T-sys. And Carl, have you computed that? Five? And so we're 3.3 out of 5, which is, which is pretty good. That's, that's a good number for uh, a working radio telescope. Question? So, so I've got two questions. One, what is it that intrinsically makes the phased array feeds relatively narrow band? Is it the impedance matching? That's one aspect of it. Um, the other is that it's hard to build a very wide band array that you can pack close together and get half wavelength spacing at the highest frequency. Now, uh, the other groups, uh, two of the other groups we mentioned, uh, Astron with the Apertif array and uh, the FAD system at DRAO Canada, they're using what's called a Vivaldi antenna, which is, it, it looks like a a horn, mm -hmm. a, a trumpet, but it's in a plane. It's just, uh, uh, you can print them on a circuit board. That is an inherently wideband antenna, uh, but matching that, matching to that is a challenge over a wide frequency mm -hmm. range. And uh, also compact spacing is, a, is an issue at the higher frequencies. Our array is uh, capable with a thickened dipole of about 30% uh, bandwidth. Is that, is that right, Carl? So about 30% of the center frequency is our operational band. Mm -hmm. Some of the arrays they're talking about an octave or 100% bandwidth, but they're having trouble with noise level. So sticking with a narrower operational band has, has helped, it, helped us with a low temperature performance. Did you have anything to add to that, Carl? Okay. 
So second question is that when you worry about the spillover, you're using a prime focus, so spillovers onto the warm ground. If you used a secondary, right, your spillover would be onto the cold sky. And because you're sh you're you can weight the elements in the phase array, you also ought to be able to optimize it for an offset clear aperture performance as you'd like to for the GBT or the SKA. Or yeah, I think that's a good observation. A secondary focus uh, application of phased array might be, I don't know of anyone who's proposing one at the moment, but there might be some advantages in terms of uh, <coughs> controlling uh, the spillover illumination. We haven't studied it, but that's a, that's a very good observation. Um, I'm sure you're aware there are a large number of astronomical problems that would benefit from <coughs> a big field of view. Right. The one I have most interest in is surveying of um, extragalactic variable objects. But there, you need a, bi a bigger field. You, you, you're, you have uh, a few degrees at most for the field. What limits the size of the field, and is it practical to think about tens of degrees instead of degrees? Uh, good question. Our field of view is, uh, is about, uh, on the 20 meter dish, uh, about plus or minus 2 degrees, so about 4 degrees field of view uh, before sensitivity drops out. There's just some, th the physics just drive it here. If you try and steer beyond that, you just cannot get the sensitivity. You can't capture enough energy being that far away from the focal point. Um, but with large dishes to get, uh, what, six, eight, ten degrees field of view, uh, I don't think we're there yet with uh, phased array feeds. <coughs> Have you looked into the cost effectiveness of uh, dealing with the spillover lobes by simply putting a screen to uh, intercept the spillover lobes and redirect them into the sky? Oh, you, you mean to extend the dish? Uh well, not the dish itself. You can put a screen just as long as it's above the ground. Uh, that has been used in effect uh, with good results at Arecibo. Oh, okay. And it was actually so actually a metal screen laying on the ground. Yes, except grass grows through it. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be a little bit above the ground. Okay. And all you can do the get the same result by placing a screen around the feed itself. Uh, of course, it cannot be close to the feed. Right. Uh, and you have to take diffraction effects and so forth. So you, you bring us, you move, you have a, you have a screen, a screen uh, some distance some away, distance from the feed dropping down to about down the uh, so edge the of the dish. The line of sight from yeah. the feed to the edge, of the it comes to, the intercepts the line of sight from the feed to the edge of the dish. And that way it intercepts all the spillover lobes. That was actually done on the uh, 25 meter at uh, Greenbank hmm. years ago. It only works well. Uh, with big dishes and short wavelengths because it does produce some blockage. Right. But if it's a big dish, the blockage is negligible. Right. Uh, it, it's it sounds like a great idea. I guess I'm not prepared to <laughs> respond to that because uh, well, I'm not sure of the, some of the practical issues. Uh, well, the screen on the ground is, is just a matter of cost. It's, yeah. you know, it's just cheap. Cheap, cheap hardware cloth or something. But it has to extend, you know, perhaps 100 yards, 100 meters on each side of the I guess dish. my sense is you want to attack that spillover, no spillover noise problems from every angle you can. Yeah, right. And uh, controlling the illumination pattern with the active phased array feed is, is certainly one way to do it. That sounds... Carl? But most feeds now are good enough that the dominant contribution of the spillover noise is actually not spillover in the traditional sense of coming from the ground. It's scattered from the dish rim, scattered from the support arms and things like that. You know, for a really well-designed, you know, high-performance feed somewhere near L-band. That, okay. Okay, well, we're, we're over time. Um, maybe one more. Has anybody looked, or is there an advantage using a deformable dish, either physically or electronically? That's a that's an a, the question is is there any advantage to using a deformable dish, either physically or optically? That seems like an attractive idea. Uh, we've uh, in our interaction with 
Rick Fisher and Roger Norod at Green Bank, we've looked at the GBT and noticed that they do have some ability to deform the plates. And we've uh, asked them about the possibility of, of uh, making adjustments so that uh, we can get a, uh, re actually extend the focal spot on the array so that <coughs> more of our phased array feed is, is actually receiving uh, energy rather than just at the center elements. Uh, it's an experiment we'd like to try. They tell us that there's uh, no chance talking anyone there into uh, playing with the, uh, the actuators in that way. So, um, you know, that, that's actually a, a study I would like to do. You know, if you had the ability to play with the dish, knowing that you're going to... See, these dishes were designed for a single horn feed. Could you do something a little different that would improve performance for a phased array feed, something other than a pure, par a pure parabola? I would really like to study that. You can probably try to use about fast. Fast. Oh, is that their large 500 yeah. meter? Right, they're, they're always going to form it into a parabola in the direction they're pointing. Ah. Uh. So they have that, and they will get the focus on the other Now, in our case, the problem is we need to form beams simultaneously in all directions, so we can't deform it for any, uh, to prefer any single direction, but perhaps there's a, a generic figure that will work best for multiple beam forming. Really yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thanks everyone for attending. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you.